What does Typhoon Haiyan, which hit the Philippines in 2013, have in common with what Napoleon Bonaparte did in 1812? In the summer of 1812, Napoleon's Grand Army of 610,000 men started out from France on a long march to Russia. The distance between France and Russia is about 6,217 kilometers. By winter the same year, this army had been reduced to just 100,000 men. So what happened? What Napoleon did not realize was that there were limited transportation options in winter when the temperatures were as low as minus 50 degrees Celsius. There simply weren't enough transportation resources to move soldiers, both able-bodied and wounded, food and water, shelters, medical supplies, firearms and ammunitions. Typhoon Haiyan was one of the deadliest typhoons to ever hit the Philippines. It brought about strong winds and heavy rains that resulted in flooding, landslides and widespread damage. When it was finally over, it was estimated that some 6,300 people have been killed, 1.1 million houses damaged or destroyed, 4.1 million people displaced from their homes. Why were the effects so severe? The provinces affected by the typhoon made up a land area of 2.4 million hectares. Roads were made impassable by fallen trees, bridges had collapsed, seaports were submerged in water, airport runways and buildings had been destroyed. There were scarcely any transportation options left to bring able-bodied people to safe shelters, sick and wounded people to medical facilities, as well as to provide food, water, shelters and medical supplies to all. Welcome to Lecture 1 of Logistics Operations and Introduction to Transportation. In today's lecture, we will look at transportation from the perspectives of history, politics, society, economics, and very importantly, the environment. The growth of civilization has always been directly associated with the development of transportation systems. Let's take a look at how that works. During the caveman age, humans were limited to moving about on foot. This restricted them to activities within a very small area around the cave. Later on, humans invented the wheel and learned to harness the strength of animals to pull them around in carriages. This immediately increased the distances that they could comfortably travel. In the 19th century, the automobile or the car was invented and this of course evolved into cargo trucks that we know today. Railway trains followed soon after. It became more possible for sustained trade and travel between neighbouring countries which were connected by land borders. The earliest known water sailing vessels date back more than 10,000 years. The first steamship, however, only came about in the 19th century. Being less dependent on wind patterns, it greatly reduced sailing times, opened up new trade routes, and is often described as a major driver in the first wave of trade globalisation. The next quantum leap came in the 20th century with the arrival of the first airplane. Although the first airplane was invited, invented by the Wright brothers in 1903, it would take another 50 years for the first commercial aircraft to be introduced in 1952. Today, worldwide, ships and planes transport hundreds of billions of tons of cargo annually. So what is the next frontier in transportation for mankind? Currently, there is an international space station in low Earth orbit 408 kilometers up in the sky. In 2018, unmanned spacecraft have already landed on Mars. Could space shuttles and rockets be a part of the future of transportation? It will almost certainly be so. Every mode of transportation requires a host of supporting infrastructure. For planes, it is necessary to have runways, airports and control towers. For ships, ports need to be constructed to allow for docking of the vessels, while specialized cranes are needed to load and unload cargo from the vessels. Trains require railway tracks to run, while cars and trucks require roads to move. Traditionally, national governments are usually involved in the planning, funding, designing and building of all these transportation infrastructure. Besides providing the transportation infrastructure, national governments and global regulatory agencies also have an important role to play in regulating transportation through legislation, 
regulations and guidelines. The ability of each country's government to efficiently, efficiently plan for and provide as well as regulate transportation networks is a direct function of the political stability of the country. From a social perspective, a good transportation network is crucial to the proper functioning of society. All aspects of society depend on it. Essentials like food and water, medicine and medical equipment need to be supplied to people. Consumer goods such as computers, mobile phones and electrical appliances are desired and demanded by people. Even the HDB flats we live in require construction materials such as cement and steel to be transported into Singapore. The actual cost of transportation is critical in determining the economic value of goods. This is known as place utility. For example, if a product costs $5 to make at location A, and the market value of this product is $15 at location B. If the cost of transportation between A and B is less than $10, it is still possible to make a profit when selling this product at B. If the cost of transportation between A and B is more than $10, selling this product at B would mean making a loss. As such, the cost of transportation determines where and when it makes economic sense to transport and sell a product. Demand and pricing varies over different periods of time. The demand for some goods and hence the demand for transportation exists only during certain periods. This is known as time utility. For example, Chinese New Year decorations or Christmas decorations would be in demand in the months preceding the respective festivals. The raw materials necessary for construction of flats in a new town would be in demand only during the construction phase of the new town. When the disaster hits a place, disaster relief supplies have an immediate time utility. It would simply be too late and meaningless if these supplies arrived only a year later. Besides achieving time utility, Transportation also needs to achieve quantity utility. Goods must be transported to the target market at the right time and in the right quantity without damage. For example, during a global launch of a new iPhone, each retailer needs to be able to receive the precise quantity of iPhones meant for them in order to fulfill pre-orders and the expected market demand. During an infectious disease outbreak, vaccines need to be supplied to the affected areas speedily in the right quantities to combat the outbreak. All the goods we consume are produced somewhere else in the world. Some form of transportation is required to bridge the supply and demand gap inherent in the system of producers and consumers. India produced 1.2 metric tons of tea in 2013. Egypt produced 11.2 million pounds of cotton in 2015. Brazil is the world's largest coffee producer and it produced 2.6 million tons of coffee in 2011. Russia produced 39 million carats of diamonds in 2014. China, of course, pretty much produces almost everything else. But none of these countries consume everything that they produce. Transportation is the key to providing the ability to match supply and demand on a global basis. There are two key rules in transportation economics. Number one, the demand for transportation is a derived demand or secondary demand. Number two, the aggregate demand for transportation is inelastic, but demand for specific modes of transportation is generally inelastic. So what does that mean? What we have in the world is a demand for products in different locations. This leads to the demand for transportation of these products from locations where they're produced to locations where they're demanded. Basically, there's no such thing as a primary demand for transportation. Transportation is only ever demanded secondarily when there is a product that needs to be moved. Let's visit something you learn from economics. An inelastic demand indicates that pricing does not affect the demand for a product. Regardless of whether the price is low or high, consumers seemingly have no choice but to buy. An elastic demand indicates that pricing affects the demand for the product. When the price is low, you will buy more. This leads us to the first part of the second rule. Aggregate demand for transportation is inelastic. The reduction of transport rates does not lead to an significant increase in the demand for transportation. Why? Transportation is a derived demand. The price for transportation does not have a significant impact on the quantity of transportation units demanded because there will always be consumer goods to be moved. 
However, while the aggregate demand is inelastic, the demand for specific modes of transportation is generally elastic. Where there are alternatives, the reduction of rates for one mode may lead to an increase in the demand for that mode. Demand shifts from one mode to another while aggregate demand remains unchanged. For example, if railway rates are discounted, the demand for moving goods by rail goes up. But does the total demand go up? No, it simply means that shippers move less by other modes and move more by the railway. It is obvious that transportation is a key driver of economic development in the history of mankind. But this has come at a great cost to humanity. Transportation is responsible for 60% of global oil consumption, 27% of global energy use, and single-handedly accounts for 23% of the world's energy-related carbon dioxide emissions. So you might ask, what's the big deal? Well, there are 4.2 million deaths every year as a result of exposure to air pollution. The health effects of air pollution are serious. One third of deaths from stroke, lung cancer and heart disease are due to air pollution. To make matters worse, Air pollutants are transformed into acid rain, snow, fog, hail, etc., which then deposit onto surfaces such as water bodies, vegetation, and buildings. This inevitably harms humans, wildlife, plants, and even results in the erosion of buildings. Several million tons of gases are released into the atmosphere because of transportation activities, and these have been contributing to climate change. So what is climate change? In a nutshell, carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere trap heat. This is known as the greenhouse effect. Global surface temperature has increased by no more than one degrees in the past century, yet this is starting to have disastrous effects. In some parts of the world, there has been unprecedented rainfall, catastrophic floods, hurricanes, and landslides, while in other parts of the world, there are raging forest fires and devastating droughts. Weather has gone mad. It is not only the humans who are affected by climate change, animals are too. For example, as the polar ice caps melt, natural habitats of polar bears are being destroyed. If nothing is being done about it, the continued decline in sea ice would reduce the global population of polar bears by two-thirds to less than 10,000 by 2050. Around 90% of the world trade is carried by ships. Besides contributing to a global economy, ships contribute greatly to water pollution. Some of the nasty stuff that ships spew into the oceans include sewage, grey water, ballast water, bilge water, solid waste, and of course oil. Planes too contribute their fair share to water pollution. Snow and ice accumulation on a plane disrupts the airflow across the aircraft surface and affects the ability of the aircraft to fly. As such, the icing fluid is generally heated and sprayed under pressure to remove ice and snow from aircraft. Unfortunately, as planes zip around the skies, the residues of these de-icing fluids end up falling into the oceans and rivers below. Major oil spills from oil cargo vessel accidents have caused untold damage on marine wildlife and environment over the years. For example, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, and an estimated 4.9 million barrels of oil was discharged and caused extensive damage to the marine and wildlife habitats, as well as the fishing and tourism industries. To this day, it is regarded as one of the largest environmental disasters in American history. Noise pollution in areas around airports, seaports, railway tracks, and major highways is a very real problem for the residential population of these areas. There is an impact on human health and it impact, impairs the quality of life. For example, studies show that people exposed to aircraft noise for an extended period of time had 24% higher chance of stroke, 21% higher chance of coronary heart disease, three times more insomnia, and overall these effects can be indeed highly devastating. 
In the marine environment, noise produced by ships also have an impact. Marine life forms such as whales and dolphins rely on underwater sound transmissions for communication, hunting for prey, and even reproduction. Noise pollution from ships disrupts marine life and results in declines in their population. Around the world, animals are finding their habitats encroached upon or totally destroyed. Wandering around the modern world, they face the hazards of modern transportation. Collisions of cars and trains with local wildlife, ranging from reindeer to wild boar, have resulted in untimely deaths of such wildlife. In Singapore, such an accident just happened on the 5th of September. A wild boar was killed by an oncoming vehicle while unwisely attempting to cross the busy Mandai Road. The motorist left the scene soon after, and a chain collision occurred involving four vehicles. In the marine environment, all sizes and types of vessels have the potential to collide with nearly any marine species. Strikes that result in death or injury to an animal often go unnoticed. Most reported collisions involve large whales, seals or sea lions. Even the birds in the air are not safe. Misguided birds regularly collide with aircraft during their takeoff, initial climb, approach and landing phases at lower altitudes. Such a collision is of course always waiter for the birds and may in turn result in serious accidents involving catastrophic aircraft failure. One such example was US Airways Flight 1549, which encountered a flock of Canadian geese and lost both its engines seconds after takeoff. Less than four minutes after the engine shut off, it landed on the Hudson River, which cuts through the New York City. All 155 people on board were safe, and the captain was hailed as a hero. So, the question all the polar bears are asking, and indeed, what all mankind should be asking. Is it too late? What is the world doing about it? I'll leave you with that as your food for thought.